Gospels to Acts 3, where we'll continue tonight. And let us pray as we open up the second session. Father, thank you for what you've given us. Thank you for the, the crystal clarity of your word. We ask that the correct interpretation of it, the Holy Spirit's interpretation, might come forth through the teacher and the remaining time we have together. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. All right, so a summarization of Acts chapter 3. Uh, we have the offer of the kingdom, again, made by God through Peter on Solomon's portico. Acts 3, beginning at verse 19. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Now, what was Israel's response? If you've received very much of my, re my teaching over the, the last 30 years, uh, you understand uh, from the scriptures, Acts 7, there, that Israel's formal response, because it was the Sanhedrin who voted that Stephen would be stoned. And so he was stoned. It was by the it was the Sanhedrin, the the ruling council of the nation, and so they stoned Stephen, and apparently Rome looked the other way because uh it was not legal for the Jews to carry out their own executions. That's why they took Christ to Pilate. So it was a mob action. But Rome somehow, uh, either through bribery or for whatever reason, they looked the other way or, or thought that it was all a rumor, that it happened, who knows, but it was uh, it was Israel's official response to the offer of the kingdom, and the Sanhedrin then uh, the the Sanhedrin's reaction is what has resulted in the decline and the postponement of God's kingdom agenda throughout the, the rest of the book of Acts. And, of course, God's agenda for Israel is going to pick up in the future right where it left off. And that will include Daniel's 70th week. It could even include a little bit of time before Daniel's 70th week, but we'll get into that uh, at, at another time. That's another subject for another time. But, of course, Israel was judged in AD 70. Jerusalem was judged under Titus of Rome, and the temple was destroyed. And ever since then, they, actually the, the Sanhedrin, continu they continued to meet until 425, A.D. 425. And they met, uh, they, they had their last meeting uh, in the city of Tiberias, which is on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, and they, they disbanded. Why they hung around and met after Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70, I have no idea. 
if they just got got together to have ice cream or something. I I honestly don't know, uh, but uh, they still thought they were the legitimate Sanhedrin in in uh, times throughout history. Uh, they've tried to revive the the Sanhedrin. There were several points throughout history. In recent history, there was even a time, uh, I believe I found it recorded in the the New York Times back in uh, uh, probably 1917 where, where they were attempting to reconstitute. Well, in... 2004, uh, a group of men met right on the, apparently right on the site uh, in Tiberias on the uh, shore of the, the, the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. They met right where they had disbanded in 425 A.D. and there has been a reconstitution of the Sanhedrin, self-proclaimed. They call themselves the Sanhedrin. Well, well, big deal, you might say. Anybody could call themselves the Sanhedrin. And it, 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 it's true. It isn't such a big deal in one sense in that there's no legitimacy there. These are unbelieving Jews. These are Jews looking for a Messiah other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So it is, uh, it's illegitimate. There's nothing legitimate about their attempt at revival. And there is, a, they're, they're going full steam ahead. There's nothing spiritually valid about it. There's actually uh, something very spiritually invalid about it in the sense that, that the authority, they, whatever authority they have, is a, a authority that uh, is allowed by Satan. And that, of course, that authority is, of course, providentially allowed by God because Satan can only do what God allows Satan to do. And uh, the prophetic plan does call for uh, the, the rebuilding of the temple. So there will be the, the uh, so-called third temple reconstructed. And the, the, what, is, what calls themselves the Sanhedrin now wants to uh, carry on the law of Moses. And, and something else for the Gentiles, which which uh, I've just become aware of recently through a, a, a good friend whom I'll protect the pri privacy of tonight. But it's it's new to me. It is quite fascinating. But uh, they do have a plan, and it's not a good plan. It's an ugly plan. Uh, it's not a good plan for the world, and I believe it is part of the the one world religious system which will ensue uh, during Daniel's 70th week. But in any case, uh, we have now a self-proclaimed Sanhedrin eager to get the, the temple reconstructed. They, they call it the third temple of uh, I've always had a problem with that because there were there were there were two temples that were actually sanctioned by God. That was Solomon's temple and then Zerubbabel's temple. Well then Herod did a makeover of the temple and some expansion and by you know by definition I would call that a rebuilding of the temple but I could see where where that wasn't sanctioned by God, so that wouldn't be considered a valid uh, rebuild of the temple. Uh, so, but then when you talk about the third temple, that's not that's not spiritually valid either. That's going to be built by unbelievers. That's something we shouldn't be giddy about as Christians. Like, oh, oh, yay, yay! It's a it, it is 
totally an evil thing that they're doing. They're, they're going to choose their own Messiah. And it is an effort to put themselves back under the law and have the law of Moses and have punishment, enforce punishment for disobedience to the law of Moses and impose another code upon the the Gentile world, which we'll uh, get into at a future time. But let's go to Acts chapter 13. So the kingdom had been offered, Stephen had been stoned, the Apostle Paul is embarking on his first missionary journey, and he is with Barnabas in Acts chapter 13, and we go to Acts chapter 13, beginning at verse 4. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as, as far as Paphos, and this was John Mark, by the way, when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was the proconsul, Sergius, or he was with, rather, but very important. I, I try to read too fast sometimes to get through things too fast. He was with this false prophet, uh, Simon, this false prophet uh, named Bar-Jesus, was with, verse 7, he was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. This is a Roman proconsul. They were given uh, territories over which they had jurisdiction to govern. So let's, let's look at it again in verse 7. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Paul and sought to hear the word of God. So what do you have here? A Gentile showing interest in the word of God. And he is with a Jew. A false, uh, a, a false prophet in verse 6. All right, verse 8. But... Elymas, or properly in the Greek, Elymas, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name. In other words, that's it uh, transliterated into the Greek. Opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So, what do you have? You have a Jewish false prophet with a Gentile. The Gentile is interested in hearing the word of God. The false prophet, the Jewish false prophet, attempts to obstruct the dissemination of the word of God and turn the proconsul, the gentle, the Gentile proconsul, away from the faith. But Saul who was also called Paul, and this is the first instance in Acts where uh, Saul of Tarsus is called Paul by the historian Luke, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil. Now what did, what did Peter and John do? looked in, intently at this lame man and said, look at us. In other words, look to us. We're, we're, we're suppo we should be your center of attention right now, not us personally, 
It's not our own spiritual lives or any power we have, but it's because it's the word of God. Look at us. What does Paul do? Okay, uh, go back to verse 7, where bar Jesus, he was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God, but Elymas the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? That harkens back to John the baptizer, doesn't it? Preparing the way of the Lord. And you could look at this false prophet as being an illustration of Israel who for many, many years had made crooked the straight paths of the Lord and had not prepared for Messiah to come. In verse 11, And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. That's the S-U-N, for a time. It also applies to the S-O-N, by the way. They won't see the S-O-N until Zechariah 12.10 when they will look upon whom they have pierced and mourn. So let's look at his let's look at his diction again in verse ten, where Paul said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, will you not stop making Crooked, the straight paths of the Lord. Wasn't that kind of the tone that Jesus had used with the uh, Pharisees and, and the, the scribes and the Sadducees back in his day? Yes, it most certainly was. Verse 11, And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you. He's speaking to the false prophet, Bar-Jesus. And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So through the years, I've often mentioned the contrast of what went on in Acts 13 and the passage I just read and what had gone on back in Acts chapter 3. The lame man was healed, was healed as an illustration, as a witness, a testimony to the fact, uh, because these Jews were eyewitnesses to the fact that this man had been lame for as long as they could remember, sitting there at the temple begging for alms. And... The healing of this man was a wonderful illustration of what could have happened to Israel had Israel responded to the words of the apostles who were one with the words of the ancient prophets and the law 
and whom Stephen, just before he he died from stoning, said that that uh, you didn't you didn't heed your your fathers, and neither do you heed the the message now. I'm paraphrasing it, but so now we have an illustration where. Paul is away from Jerusalem and in the presence of a Gentile and a Jew seeks to prevent Sergius Paulus, the Gentile, from hearing the word of God. And Paul performs his first recorded miracle. He doesn't heal a man, he blinds a man. And the blindness is temporary. But notice this detail. Just like the, just like the judicial blindness is temporary. In Romans 11.25, And brethren, I would not have you be ignorant of this mystery that a partial hardening, that means not all Jews, but many Jews, and it would go on until the fullness of the Gentiles would come in. There is a partial hardening of Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in or been completed. And we know that the fullness of the Gentiles will will be completed when the last Gentile is saved during this present dispensation and the Lord Jesus Christ returns to meet us in the clouds of the air, whether whether we're uh, physically dead by that time or still alive. That's the mechanics by which we will meet the Lord Jesus Christ. And... What happened to this Jew immediately midst and darkness fell upon him. And, uh, but it was only going to be for a time, as the, uh, the Apostle Paul said in verse 11. You'll, not, you'll, you'll be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately midst and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. And then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. And this prepared the model for what happened later on. I'll get into it to some of it in Acts 13, if I can do it and still get you out of here on time. If I can't, I won't. I'll make sure that, that we close on time. But just consider what we've read so far and the, the resemblance to what was offered to the Jews in the illustration of the lame man. Is this thing that happened to this Jewish false prophet the same thing that has happened on a larger scale to the Jews and to the Gentiles because as you go through the the, uh, way that Paul and his companions went to these cities, they began at the synagogue and were rejected by uh, the majority of the Jews. Some Jews believed, and other Jews didn't believe, and some of those who didn't believe went. They tried to stir up trouble, just like Bar-Jesus did, to prevent the dissemination of the gospel to the Gentiles. And this was the, this was the model. This is how it happened. And Gentiles, many more than Jews, believed. And that's how it's been since that time, because we're, we're in that particular dispensation right now. 
In fact, the Apostle Paul, right it later on in Acts 13, gives the, the scriptural precedent for turning now to the Gentiles because of the rejection of the word of God by the Jews. But is this what has happened to the Jews right now? Uh, let your attention fall upon this blind man now, having been recently made blind and having to rely on going about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Is this what has happened to the Jews during this present dispensation? I believe so. And I am not anti-Semitic. I just believe we, we do have to recognize what the Bible says about the Jews. They are in temporary blindness. They are under judicial blindness for a time. And many of them are being saved as well. And when they do, they become members of the body of Christ during this dispensation. But this is exactly what has happened through the Jews or to the Jews. And you've had throughout history, even uh, recent history, what's been happening. The, the, the history of the present nation of Israel really tells the story. You've had Gentile nations manipulating the Jews, but the Jews relying on the Gentile nations to allow them to have a state. And, and you, you have these things you can... I won't go into them deeply tonight, and that they're they're very complex. I mean, they, they, I'm no expert on them. They they, uh, they would these events in themselves would take a, a magnitude of study to really understand them. And a, a, another great study of ancient and uh, present culture of Israelites to be able to understand them in, in a better way. But just as an outline, you had in 1917 the Balfour Declaration, and then you had in uh, uh, 1947, right before David Ben-Gurion proclaimed the nation of Israel to be a state. You had United Nations Resolution 181, known as the Partition Resolution, uh, where control would be administered by the, the UN. That was 1947. What has been going on with Israel is uh, what went on with this blue, this, <laughs> this Jew who was under temporary blindness, temporary blindness. He had to go about seeking who could lead him by the hand. And who has Israel been led by the hand by uh, Gentile nations? And that's where we stand to that's where we stand today. And so when you get into uh, when you get in, in, into this model for what happened between Paul, Sergius Paulus, and a false Jewish prophet, and you take it up to Paul's first uh, uh main visit in his first missionary journey to Antioch in Pisidia. What does he say? Of course, they, they start at the synagogue. Uh, they went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He gives a sermon, but at the end of his sermon, sermon uh, verse 38, or toward the end of his sermon, Verse 38, let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, he's speaking to Jews in the synagogue, 
that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed. That's better translated like it is in the King James Version, version justified, dikaiao, that's how it's translated everywhere else I know uh, about is justified from everything from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware for therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. That's uh, from Isaiah. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told to them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas as they spoke with them, uh, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath day, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. So this was quite a sensational uh, visit. The next Sabbath day, verse 44, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. That's why Romans 1.16 the, the, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and then the Greek. It, it's Jew and Gentile. Synagogue first so that God could be publicly vindicated in his setting aside of Israel, then focus on the Gentiles. But... Uh, notice here, verse 46, uh, verse 45... But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. That's amazing. You judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. That's like this this pseudo-humility thing uh, where we have poor self-esteem. And to some people, that seems like, like humility, but it's really not. It's arrogance. Well, that's a, another, another subject for another time. But since you thrust it aside... And judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. That's a composite of Isaiah 42, 6 and Isaiah 49, uh, verse 6. This is not saying that the prophetic plan is part of mystery doctrine. This is, this is an application of prophetic verses saying that since you Jews are stopping the covenant program from moving forward, then we have no other choice if people are going to be saved than to turn to the Gentiles. And verse 48, and when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying uh, the word of God, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And we could also say for, the, for any Calvinist who might be within hearing, I don't think there are any here, but they, they might hear this uh, by uh, means of uh, uh, video or something, 
uh, that could be equally said as many as believed were the ones who had been appointed to eternal life. The point being that who is appointed to eternal life? Believers. Believers. The Calvinist makes the assumption, errone the erroneous assumption, that only after regeneration can one believe. So that God has to come to a person regardless of the, the will of the person. Uh, the, the will of man has no say at all. God regenerates because that person is one of the elect. And after God regenerates that person, he or she is able to believe. Well, we've got to wrap it up. Uh, I may be late. My watch keeps getting later and later, so I could be a couple minutes late. I apologize. Let's close with prayer. Father, thank you for what you've given us tonight. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen.